So welcome everyone to our second session of the European Command and Belt Responders course. And this week we are going to focus on extreme temperatures. We hope you enjoy it as much as last time. And uh, we have a, an amazing lineup of uh, presenters to, um, to take us through this topic today. I'll just uh, go through some uh, introductory points and then we'll start with um, the lecture itself. So this is, as I said, the second session of uh, 10 and um, you should have seen the syllabus and the schedule on the website. So the learning objectives are first to explain the impact of extreme temperatures, especially extreme heat on health, to identify factors that increase vulnerability to extremes of temperature, especially extreme heat, to discuss how populations need to adapt to extreme temperatures through changes in the built environment and in individual behavior, and to discuss how public health and healthcare systems need to adapt their emergency preparedness and response systems to protect the population from extreme temperatures. So this will be a 90 minute session or one hour and a half. And we'll start with um, a lecture about 45 minutes and then two 10 minute case studies and we'll have uh, 15 minutes for um, questions at the end. So we are going to ask you to kindly enter your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat function, but the Q&A box. And uh, we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end within that 15 minute interval. The questions that cannot be answered, we'll kindly ask the presenters to answer them offline and uh, then upload them together with the slides for the session and the video to the, um, to the GCCHE website. So as, a, as, a, as last time, the session will be recorded and available on the website within 24 hours as well as all the resources. So participants who attend over 70% of the live sessions and pass the final exam with a score over 70% will be awarded a certificate of participation in this course. And uh, participants need to join each session using their personal unique Zoom links and complete the final exam using the email address used to initially register for the course. And the exam link will be sent on the final day of the, the course by email and remain open for 48 hours. And the certificates will then be awarded a week later, also on the 16th of April. So today's session, we have, we're going to start with a lecture by Dr. Andrea Schmidt, who is the head of Department on Climate Resilience and One Health Competence Center Climate and Health, the Austrian National Public Health Institute in Austria. Then we'll have two case studies. The first one with Dr. Philippe Lefebvre, who is the de development manager of the Urban Climate Services in Beto in Belgium. Then we'll finish with Dr. Marco Morabito, who is a senior researcher at the National Research Council the, at the Institute of uh, Bioeconomy in Italy. So thank you very much. And uh, you have there the QR code for the post-session survey. And um, if you may struggle at the end to click on the link, so we would encourage you to open the link that should be available on the chat 
now and leave it open in a separate window and then you can answer it um, at the end. That would be really good. We'll also send um, an email after the session and the link to the survey will be there if you are not able to uh, answer these very quick questions at the end, uh, immediately at the end of the session. So without further ado, I will pass on to um, Dr. Andrea Schmidt, who will start the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this introduction and thank you to everyone for the kind um, postings in the chat already. It's quite nice to see that everyone is here from around the world. I feel very honored to be able to um, share um, this lecture with you on extreme temperatures. Um, I will share my screen right now and would like to also say some introductory uh, words. So uh, I, um, the presentation was prepared with uh, the team at the Competence Center Climate and Health, Katarina uh, Bruger, Felix Kust, Mila Kostina Lappel, and Ivan Kovovart. And um, I would also like to say that uh, I see this lecture also as a conversation about extreme temperatures. So I would also like to invite you all to um, share your projects that you're working on. I know that it's a rapidly evolving field, uh, climate and health in general, but also the topic of heat and extreme temperatures. So feel free also to share your projects uh, in the chat um, and we can then also follow up afterwards because obviously we will not have time uh, to answer or to talk to everyone today. Um, as myself, I've been deep diving on this topic uh, in the past two years. I come, I'm an economist and a social scientist, um, and I will be talking mainly from a health system perspective uh, about extreme temperatures today. So I'm not a medical doctor, I'm also not a meteorologist, uh, just as background information to you. So I, uh, without further ado, I would like to start, um, but just one thing maybe before, uh, I would like to invite you to take a step back yes, uh, in front of your computer and maybe take a breath and think um, about uh, what you associate with heat, the topic of heat. Um, and I would like to ask you to post uh, one word, just one word, or an emoji that you connect uh, with the topic of heat. The lecture is called Extreme Temperatures, but it's uh, it will be mainly focusing on extreme heat. I will be saying something also about cold. So you can also post in the chat something about cold, but mainly it should be about heat. Um, so thank you very much. And um, what to expect has been already uh, kindly introduced. So I will just give you a short overview of um, the different parts of my presentation, of my lecture. Uh, I will first give you information about uh, heat and extreme temperatures. Um, and then I will be saying something also about uh, extreme temperatures and how they impact on human health. I will be talking about vulnerability factors and vulnerable groups in, uh, in turn. And um, then I will move on to what populations can do, first at the structural level, but also at an individual level. And I will conclude with um, the responses that health systems can take, healthcare systems can take, and um, we'll then end with some take-home messages um, for everyone. Let me start by setting the scene and also maybe by saying that many of the slides will be focusing on Europe. Europe is uh, obviously the area where there is so far much lower awareness also regarding heat risks. Um, but obviously, we can also learn a lot from other countries, countries in the global south, um, from their experiences. And so, um, again, the invitation of share your uh, work in the chat. You've already seen last week uh, some of the, the status quo that is quite uh, concerning. Uh, we are at the moment moving towards uh, 1.14 um, te uh, temperature uh, increase compared to pre-industrial level. We move on track towards 2.7 degrees globally. Um, another statistic is that uh, people, uh, older people, 
and their heat related deaths have increased by 85% since the 1990s at global level. And the high temperatures account for almost 12 million years of healthy life years lost at global level. 2023 has been confirmed as the warmest calendar year in global temperature data in the record going back to 1850. So these are just some of the very concerning uh, trends that we are facing. And it's also one of the reasons why um, heat uh, is becoming increasingly uh, a health risk across the globe. And um, that affects generations differently. We should uh, not forget that uh, people who are born in 2020 face a much higher risk of being exposed to heat and heat risks than this was the case for people born, for example, in 1950 or 1980. So uh, it's also a moral responsibility that we have towards future generations. And it is also uh, a responsibility that we can still um, that we can still tackle because uh, climate, uh, obviously we can act on it. And this is also the main message in the IPCC report, the report of the International Panel on Climate Change, that we should keep in mind that we can still do something about climate change. And this is not a given that um, this development has to look like this for future generations. But nonetheless, we need to act. And um, the degree to which we need to act on heat um, is also still uh, a matter of um, some different scenarios. So I would like to show you here also um, three graphs. The first one on the upper left side shows you um, in the y-axis, so the y-axis is the vertical axis, the probability of a certain climate occurring. And this is, <clears throat> this is uh, and, and on the, on the x-axis, you can see the different temperatures, so ranging from cold, to hot weather. Now, what we see at the moment is the left, the left, uh, the left um, graph. And uh, if we assume that there is an increase in the mean, we would see that hot weather is increasing, and there is also more record. Up. So we differentiate here between the mean and in the lower graph. The, what is the variance? The variance means that also the range of wet extreme temperatures is increasing. So whereas in the upper graph, we see only an increase in the mean, um, and this graph is moving to the right side. So we see overall hotter weather and more record hot weather. In the lower graph, where we see increase in the variance, you can see that this curve is getting flatter. And we're also seeing the increase in more record cold weather and more cold weather. So that's also one of the reasons why this lecture is called extreme temperatures and not just heat. And then there are different scenarios that might assume an increase in both the mean and the variance. And that's the third graph that you can see here on the upper right side. And uh, in, for example, this could mean that there will be also a shift towards much more hot weather and more record hot weather. So just for you to understand that there are different uh, ways of also considering extreme temperatures in the context of climate change. Now, when we talk about heat waves, and as you saw, uh, heat will be becoming uh, increasingly uh, a relevant topic, um, we need to also understand that heat waves cannot be defined universally, but rather um, we have um, certain characteristics. The EU Climate uh, Service defines it as, um, as periods rise by several days of very warm temperatures compared to the local or the regional average. That shows us already that this has always also a regional component. And it's also a period of at least three consecutive days that exceeds the 99th percentile of the daily maximum temperatures of the major September season. So that means also that it's dependent on the region and the daily maximum temperatures that are usually in Europe, we often use a definition that is um, was um, created by Jan Kisseli, a Czech uh, meteorologist, and it's defined as three subsequent days with the daily maximum air temperature larger than 30 degrees until the daily maximum air temperature drops below 25 or until the mean drops below um, 30 degrees. Of course, uh, as you will know also from weather reports, um, the relative humidity as well as the wind speed 
play a role in how we perceive heat, whether or not we feel that it's very hot or not, um, is dependent also on the humidity and the wind. And um, there is also a, um, an informal definition of tropical nights, which um, obviously has also a large impact on health, and uh, they are defined as having a minimum temperature um, of over 20 degrees. I'm now moving to part two, which is the, how the impact, uh, how extreme temperatures are impacting the mental health. And now be aware, we're not talking only about hot weather, so not just the sun, but also cold weather. So we're talking about extreme temperatures. If you remember the curve that I showed you before, it might uh, like some, some climate change scenarios are also assuming an increase in both extreme cold and extreme hot weight. And um, both of these are, uh, so there's a kind of uh, commonality also with these, uh, which is that there are both, there's an increased risk for a wide range of the cardiovascular or respiratory um, diseases as well as other causes. And um, for both also, it's, it's a complex topic, obviously, because we have biological pathways that um, are interacting with each other. And there's a large, um, with a, a large um, compository of the literature as well. Now, what's different between these two, whether or not we're talking about cold or warm uh, extreme temperatures, is that for warm, um, so, the, so for heat, the physiological response, so the response of our bodies is, um, is uh, lasting less long than for the cold, where, because in the cold, in the case of cold, and extreme cold, it can last for several weeks um, that our body is still responsive. Then it also depends, obviously, on the um, way we are acclimatized to um, hot weather or cold weather. Populations have already developed different adaptation responses, and the susceptibility is also not the same across um, the globe. What is also interesting, maybe for you, if um, we are comparing cold and hot extreme temperatures, is that a multi-country study that was um, carried out in three hundred more in three hundred eighty-four locations showed um, that in fact the temperature-related mortality is by way higher when we talk about extreme cold. But what we should keep in mind is that our public health systems are not as well prepared to hot weather, um, whereas to cold weather they might be uh, better prepared depending on where you live. Um, and what is the second finding that this study had was that um, the effect of um, days that were uh, milder, especially in terms of milder cold, had a large had a large than uh, the extreme cold. So that's also something to um, take into account. But in general, the message is that public health plans should consider both low and hot end of temperatures and their associated health risks. Now we'll move on and we'll tell you still a little bit, so you will get a little bit colder still, but then we are going to move towards the hot weather. So uh, Sirius, um, what, what happens when it's extremely cold? Um, serious health problems occur because of prolonged exposure and uh, it's mainly uh, the cardiovascular and respiratory effects that are underlying cold related mortality, uh, as well as hyperthermia and frostbites. And as I already said, physiological responses can persist for longer than those attributed to heat. And it's usually a close to the response of hot. Now, it's getting hot. I will, um, in the rest of the talk, focus on heat. Um, and I will start with the physiological impact. Um, you see two graphs on this slide. On the left side, you can see a graph that was published in a paper by uh, Kirsten Abey. And um, she, um, she described uh, quite nicely the different cardiovascular um, as well as um, uh, other organ-related um, responses that our body has to extreme. It's mainly two primary responses. First, it's um, the redistribution of the blood flow towards the skin. And uh, that in, um, act, um, increases cardiac demand. And the second one is sweats, and that might lead them later to dehydration. 
What is um, you can see here is that uh, different organs might be affected by extreme heat, in particular heart, kidney, intestines, liver, and lung. Um, but at the same time, and that's on the right graph, um, it's not it's not everyone who is going to die of this luckily from from heat strokes. But what we also should consider is that um, extreme heat may or also um, create mild symptoms and a lot of discomfort, such as heat fatigue or heat cramps. It may also worsen existing diseases, and we will still hear about that. And then in the severity, um, much higher is obviously the heat stroke, but luckily this is affecting much less people. But we shouldn't forget also about the lower part, because this affects a much larger share of the population. We'll see here how this relates, for example, also to aspects of inequality. Now, what heat does, it, it, it impacts on health, as I already said. So um, it has some direct impacts. And there might be um, heat illness or accelerated death, but also hospitalizations. You might need health care. But then, and this is the topic of this slide, there are indirect impact. So uh, for once, it's impact on health services. So there are is an increased burden on health services um, themselves and also the healthcare workforce, as well as, for example, informal caregivers that have to take care of, um, of people that are vulnerable to heat. Second, it's an increased risk of accident, for example, work-related accident. Third, it's an increase in transmission of food and waterborne diseases, but also, for example, poor air quality and uh, extreme heat is also increasing the amount of ozone pollution and particulate matter. And fourth, the potential disruption of infrastructure. So we shouldn't think about heat in a unilateral. Lastly, you already heard uh, some of the indicators and how we can measure the impact of heat on health, but I would just take a brief moment to still summarize some of these indicators for you. Uh, in general, we are just um, differentiating between the meteorological parameters when we talk about heat, but then when we talk about how it impacts on health, we talk mainly about mortality or morbidity, but also, for example, the loss of productivity. We're not able to concentrate as well. We are affected by fatigue much more when we are uh, confronted with extreme. And um, this is also a list uh, of the lens of count of global indicators list on heat, as well as from the European um, countdown. And as I said, you already heard about this uh, last week party, but I would like to dive dig, dig deeper into some of these indicators. At the global level, for example, heat um, is also contributing to a change in labor capacity. What you can see in this graph is um, the hours lost in different sectors. So in these four sectors, in agriculture, in construction, in manufacturing, and service, that is um, attributed to heat effects, depending on the metabolic rates that are um, attributed to the activities in each sector and the number of workers that each effect. You can see that agriculture and construction are affected um, by the law. The second indicator relates to heat-related mortality incidents. This graph will not be a surprise for you. It's a, a map of Europe, and you can see that in Southern Europe, um, mortality incidents is higher. But one surprising fact here is that, in fact, we're seeing that, um, that in Southern European countries, there might be a tendency to see morbidity and mortality to heat. Whereas in the Northern European countries, we're seeing an increase in vulnerability. But that has to do with the fact that some countries are much less prepared. And it points again to the importance of public health responses when we talk about the awareness of the patient. Um, currently, we are confronted with a scenario of doubling of heat related deaths in Europe in a no adaptation scenario. Um, we're also seeing that between 2013 and 2022, there were 25,500 more deaths that were attributed to heat um, than between the, in the decades um, um, before. And also there is, um, there is a difference uh, across countries, as I already said, and as you can see also. 
Now, another indicator that's quite interesting in this context is um, physical activity related to health, uh, um, related health heat stress uh, risks. Um, so uh, what you can see here is um, the risk of heat stress increasing with physical activity. So, and if you can see that it's increasing across Europe, you can see the different lines, the different regions, the European regions, and you can also see quite clearly that it has actually um, across the past decades. Now, what does it tell us? It, it, many of you might be health professionals or work in the health sector, and obviously when the risk of health-related uh, risks increases um, with heat and with physical activity to, um, related to heat, then this has also implications for health promotion, for health-related recommendations, um, when we shouldn't do physical activity, for example, or who shouldn't be doing physical activity during certain hours of the day. So this was the introductory part, and I'm now moving on to what vulnerability means. Vulnerable groups in the context of heat um, will be defined, and also some vulnerability factors and mechanisms uh, will be explained. You can see um, here um, the graph that uh, describes quite nicely that um, there are some mediating factors. So there are some factors in the middle that lead from heat to give that or that can also uh, mediate or avoid uh, this uh, obviously a uh, deadly outcome when we talk about heat. Um, first, it's exposure. Exposure, uh, as I'm going to explain also later, is um, how much um, I'm forced to experience heat, for example, because I have to work outside in my job or because I'm a sports woman due to my living or working condition where I'm a homeless. The second one is sensitivity to a given heat exposure. So I'm already experiencing heat stress, but then it depends on my sensitivity, um, how, I can, how well my body can also handle it. And finally, it's about access to treatment, but also other factors that we call adaptive capacity in how we can avoid um, some severe outcomes uh, related to heat. And you can see this here. So we have three blocks. One is exposure, as I said before. So for example, people who are um, have no housing or outdoor workers have a higher exposure. Second is sensitivity. How well can my body handle the stress? Now, here we have, especially people who are older, infants and babies, people who are pregnant, people who cannot leave the house, people with mental illnesses or other chronic medical conditions. Also, the medication that we are taking might influence our thermal regulation. And finally, also, um, if we have to use some medical equipment that we are dependent on or that we have something. Obviously, not at least it can be completely exhausted. And then the third block is about adaptive capacity. It's about how well can I take measures and adapt to it? How well can I cope with heat, recover from heat stress, or adjust to the impact heat event? And this, as we will see later, has been quite an important factor also in previous heat waves, whether it be in Chicago or in Europe. And um, we see, we saw that um, people, for example, who are not mobile, cannot leave the house, who are socially isolated, um, but also, um, People who live in areas that are not used to extreme heat might be more. So this is about um, how well I can. So please remember the word adaptive capacity because it, it's from a public health perspective and very. Also, please keep in mind that uh, multiple burdens are usually present at the same time. Not uh, one person can be put on the category, but we are all um, people. Uh, and human beings that are usually not uh, characterized only by one group. Now, uh, I will just go very briefly, but maybe you can look it up later uh, about the into the mechanisms. And what I would like to highlight here is that also women, gender, and pregnancy are um, vulnerability factors. So we've seen in previous studies that there is an increased risk of preterm births. Um, during heat waves, 
and uh, gender may also play a role, obviously, together with other factors such as age or social isolation um, in, in influencing heat related morbidity and mortality. The question is also how well I perceive myself as a group um, that is at risk, or how, how much I, um, I think of myself. And previous studies have found that usually um, there is some overlap. So if you live in a socially vulnerable area, you might be more um, receiving more risk. But then there are certain groups that do not judge uh, risks accurately, particularly white men have been found to be judging the risk of heat to be lower than other groups. And also older people who are one of the vulnerable groups in context of heat uh, they tend not to consider themselves vulnerable to it. I would also like to say that obviously it's important not to um, put all, all the people in a box, but we need to differentiate also in terms of the characteristics. Um, not every class uh, will be the same. Uh, we need to differentiate between people who are 80 or older who are um, requiring long term care or more state expansion. And in fact, uh, many countries have implemented also programs where they use the resources of all the people in terms of um, supporting actually action against these risks. And finally, the media also has an important influence on influencing risk perceptions. Um, so um, there are some recommendations from the Global Heat Health Information Network that I can go into detail right now, but um, four key recommendations. First, frame heat in the context of climate change. Don't talk about it as an abstract uh, event, but it's really related to climate change. And seen also in the previous slide. Highlight action and solutions. Don't just inform passively that it will get hot. For example, inform how you can get to a cooling center um, or, or similar. Third, acknowledge that it's not an equal impact for everyone. Not everyone is equally affected. And fourth, Give attention also to indirect your health impacts, what I've shown you also before. Now, I would like to also share some selective evidence on how actually heat stress is affecting vulnerable groups. These are just four studies um, that I cannot go into much detail right now because it's also some more um, some presentation, but you were not very welcome also to look up these um, sources that I mentioned. Um, generally, um, we see that, for example, people uh, experiencing homelessness are, uh, have an elevated risk of um, becoming hospitalized during heat waves. Um, parents or children are at risk of poverty report that children are um, more aggressive, sleep less well, are um, cry more, are restless. Um, a study from Shanghai showed that. Um, the impact was um, unequally distributed, especially among older people, um, but also um, people with lower education and outdoor workers. A study from the US showed um, that non white population was at a higher risk. And in Hamburg, um, there was a study that showed an increase in the relative risk of preterm birth. The European Union has also developed um, an app that is um, quite useful and I would like to highlight it here. I cannot uh, um, show it to you right now, but you're very welcome also to look it up where it would be a suitable solution for your for the region where you live. Um, it consists of two um, two parts. The first one is a, so the extreme, it's called Extrema and it's an emergency notification system consisting firstly of an app for the public your heat related risk in real and in real time and it will um, tell you about your um, individual heat related risk um, using satellite thermal images but also weather predictions for your regions and it also may include information on cooling centers or other spaces where you can go during heat waves and health recommendations and you could also include multiple profiles such as for your family members um, that you are taking care of. And then there, it includes also an administration web service dashboard, um, which then would allow also um, municipalities or cities to create um, um, heat-related emergency notifications that are not just for the general population, but that might be more um, adapted for vulnerable groups. 
Um, you may know that uh, the current VT-related um, emergency warning systems are actually often oriented along a male, 35-year-old, 75-kilo um, walking person. So it's when if you think about all the vulnerable groups that I've mentioned before, it's obviously not meant for everyone. So a heat risk for a 35-year-old man will occur much later than for a person who is frail, who um, cannot leave uh, the home, or has a certain chronic condition, especially um, cardiovascular disease has been identified as the main risk for heat-related uh, strokes. So I'm now moving to part four, how the populations need to adapt. And um, I will focus on structural level, but also individual level measures. Um, and we know at the structural level that uh, measures um, can be taken in particular at the level of uh, built, uh, built infrastructure um, so and the built environment. So as you can see in the graph here, schematically, cities are particularly um, vulnerable to the impacts of heat. And this is called the urban heat island effect. And it has certain... Um, and the reasons are that there is a higher amount of uh, impervious surfaces, there is um, usually less vegetation, um, there is also motor vehicle exhaust that may increase um, the air quality um, resulting from heat, etc. And also um, heat uh, tropical nights will occur much more likely also in cities. And if you think, for example, about public health solutions, such as cooling centers, so places where people can go to cool down, these will usually not be open during the night. So especially tropical nights in cities um, represent um, a problem that may require a response still from the health side. And um, obviously, again, there's an unequal distribution of exposure. And here are some other factors that you can um, look into um, later on that are um, contributing to urban heat islands. I would now like to move on to um, a study that was done by the European Environmental Agency and it uh, looked into um, the exposure uh, of schools and hospitals um, in European countries. Now let me tell you about hospitals. If we think about hospitals and when they when they are located in areas are vulnerable to heat stress, obviously the vulnerable groups that are located in these hospitals will also be affected by heat stress themselves because often also the infrastructure may not be adequately prepared. And the study found that out of 1,304 hospitals, nearly half were located in an area that um, where the uh, urban heat island effect was uh, two degrees larger. Um, and you can see here an example of the city of Prague. So maybe this is also something that you can do in terms of an analysis for your. Here is another example of um, the city of Vienna, so more at the local level, where also an urban heat vulnerability index was created that again, um, that considered the adaptive capacity, here defined as access to green spaces and water bodies, exposure and sensitivity. So again, these three factors that we discussed before, but here from a um, city level um, perspective. And I think in the case studies afterwards, we will just go field on it. Now, um, I cannot go into a lot of detail on the urban planning here, but um, just maybe some ideas of what can be done at the uh, urban level to reduce health stress, uh, heat stress. Um, Albedo, um, maybe one uh, example. So uh, as you can see in the graph below, uh, for example, um, re uh, reducing, uh, increasing the amount of reflection of solar radiation by having white roofs, for example, also creating water bodies, urban greening, we will hear about that later on, and um, also including health impact assessments systematically for building. However, as many of you work in the health sector, you will know that there are some obvious challenges, such as that health authorities temporarily hold formal competences over um, and that uh, interventions in the built environment are not only time intensive, but also labor intensive and costly. 
and it's not always easy to act immediately uh, on the urban issues. Another factor to consider when we talk about the built environment is indoor heat exposure. And um, it's here are some facts that might be interesting for you because, for example, EU population spends up to 90% of their time indoors. And an important aspect here is that heat-related mortality tends to happen disproportionately at home. And we will hear about that as well. And here are some measures to reduce indoor heat exposure um, that I cannot go into detail right now, but that we're really happy also to look up. Maybe one word about air conditioning, um, because it's often also suggested as a measure uh, in care homes or in general in, um, in apartments. Uh, according to the International Panel on Climate Change, um, climate resilient development includes also the reduction of greenhouse gases. So when we, um, when we are um, integrating air conditioning, we are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So we are actually doing the opposite of what we are supposed to do in the sense of tackling climate change. And that is called maladaptation of climate change. To the impact of climate change by making it worse um, and increasing greenhouse gas emissions. So a better solution would be improved insulation or investing in shading shutters, for example. I also promised to talk about individual level, but let me say that I would like to keep this very short. These are the, this is the advice given by the World Health Organization. Um, it includes four um, pillars, keep out of the heat, keep your home cool, keep your body cool and hydrated, and check on family, friends, and neighbors. But again, let me say, and you remember, uh, adaptive capacity is not the same for everyone. And uh, so we, um, in, in general, it's, um, it's important for individuals to know what they should do and uh, to adapt to heat. But from a public health perspective, um, the structural responses will be more um, important to protect also those who cannot act individually. I'm moving to the last part before I get to the take home messages. What are the implications for health systems um, in terms of heat and extreme heat uh, events? First, um, many health systems have introduced heat health action plans, and um, a couple of studies have also looked into how effective these are. However, there is a real gap in outcome evaluations of these prevention plans. So um, we do know that most likely public health prevention is associated with significant part of the reduction of heat impact, However, there is a big gap also in outcome evaluation. So for those of you working on research, um, this would be really an important gap to tackle. And um, we've seen uh, several studies um, that have evaluated uh, heat health action plans. Um, and you can find them here in also in these references. Um, but I would again like to stress that uh, reporting, monitoring, and evaluation is not our um, yet uh, sufficient. Um, we do see that there is a reduction, but for example, there would be also a need for periodic updates um, in terms of like what are the vulnerable groups, how do they change maybe over time, what, uh, what happens um, with new uh, scenarios of heat waves, etc. A really interesting European project, the ANVIL project, has published a policy brief that I really recommend also um, reading. And uh, they looked into what is actually happening already at um, the European level in terms of implications. And they found that many actions um, that uh, tackle um, heat impacts on vulnerable groups are um, focused on older people and workers, as well as on information pooling. Um, so in fact, the study was also not, not only carried out in Europe, but it was a general literature study that included also many studies from the US. And what I find quite interesting is the categorization that they make on the types of interventions that are being taken. And it's something also that we can learn from. So first, um, it's preparatory interventions and long-term measures. So it's not just reacting acutely to a heat emergency, but really thinking ahead about what we need to prepare in our health system. And they have four interventions. The first one is education training programs for social and healthcare workers. 
So the healthcare workers need to learn how to identify these emergencies, how to monitor them, how to manage them. And uh, the social workers would be building community cohesion or um, improve awareness among groups that are not so easy to reach. The second one is about hot housing, building some spatial planning measures, for example, retrofitting hospitals or renovating schools. The third one is about information campaigns, but it's recommended that they are more effective when they're not a standalone measure. The fourth one is acclimatization interventions in workers for, and athletes, but also, for example, for soldiers, firefighters, and uh, represent long term. Now, the second category would be emergency. So when heat waves hitting, um, what, what can we actually do uh, as a health? And again, there are four categories. The first one is active outreach. It includes especially measures that are targeted towards older people, fragile people, people who are isolated, have a volunteer network that carries out home visits, phone calls um, to these groups. Second, cooling centers and other facilities. As I said, they're not open during the night, so this is a weakness of these cooling centers that might be in place. Third, healthcare facility emergency protocols that may be carried out at two levels. So first at the institutional level in terms of indoor temperatures um, um, and temperature controlling. And the second at the patient level. So monitoring really the health um, of the patients that are vulnerable in the hospital. They didn't find any evidence on measures that were related to the actual services. So, for example, when we're discharging a patient that might be vulnerable for a heat stroke, are we um, having clinical pathways that connect them, for example, to a community center, et cetera? And the fourth one is about protection measures in workers and in patients. I already mentioned a little bit. I they're already from previous uh, heat waves, and I will skip this slide now because uh, we, I'm running out of time. But I would like to maybe just say one word um, about previous heat waves, um, which is that um, what I found quite interesting is that actually people who were isolated and who were living at home were those most affected. So we're not talking about those who are making it to the hospital. We're talking about especially people with cardiovascular diseases that are not never admitted to a hospital. We see that there is always a difference between um, people dying in hospital and people dying at home from heat. And this has been quite um, quite interesting also in previous studies. For example, also widows and widowers, or people mainly living alone. Um, work. And Jan Semenza, who will be also um, hosting one of the lectures in this course, um, did a very interesting study um, after the 1995 Chicago heat wave, where they did a case control study um, by identifying who was a control for the people who died um, in Chicago during that heat wave. It was more than 700 deaths in a five day period. And they found that the greatest risk was found for people with a medical illness, but who were socially isolated and did not have access to air conditioning. And the protective factor that they identified, which I find also quite interesting from a public health perspective that having social contacts such as group activities or friends and um, protected people can, uh, from uh, dying. And so we have several implications for heat health uh, warnings. And I think we will hear more about that in the case studies. Um, but uh, one is the level of the hospital. So for example, to have triage and treatment protocols, but also ensuring that the clinical staff is prepared Second, the assessment of the community that surrounds my health institution and identify the people who are most vulnerable. The third one communicates of collaboration. For example, in Switzerland, they've established a heat body system that um, is attaching volunteers, as I said, also often older people who are still fit and active and that are willing to look after neighbors um, when the heat waves uh, is occurring. Um, also another, um, wording here that I quite like is the community champion that can be identified and that um, can help also avoid um, severe impacts. And overall, it's important that we keep in mind that reacting to heat related events is about climate resilience and climate resilience includes all uh, a lot of different um, areas. It's not just about heat itself. It's, um, it's about uh, managing climate related well, about developing health system capacity 
long-term vision and promoting whole of society. I do not have time to delve into this right now, but I recommend you the publication published last year um, in an updated version by the WHO. And the US Climate Resilience Toolkit is also quite interesting from that perspective um, because they are also um, providing some recommendations on how to um, develop climate resilience in healthcare for extreme health events, for extreme health events. And they differentiate three different areas. Um, vulnerability assessments, essential clinical care services, and infrastructure protection. I'm moving to the take-home messages, um, and I would like to show you um, the graph here, which um, is um, a graph that is taken from the um, Lancet Pathfinder report, um, which is also quite interesting read. And it relates to co-benefits. So when we talk about heat protection, we should try, we could also try to frame it in a positive way because heat may not only, heat protection may not only um, produce costs and energy and require a lot of effort, but we as public health professionals should also try to think about the co benefits of heat protection. So, how can we have life when we are protecting ourselves from heat and adapting to heat? And um, this is the graph that is referring not to heat, but to climate change in general. But it's still giving some inspiration of what um, can be done better. And one important um, aspect here is uh, tree and vegetation cut. So greener areas have been really shown in previous studies to have a great modification for heat-related mortality. And if we think about that, um, when we do when we work on heat-related effects, um, we will also it will also be easier for us to think about it in the positive. And the take-home messages, just to conclude. Um, you can gain something from heat protection, focus on multi-solving and co benefits for health. Second, it's mainly about public health, involve health and long-term care professionals in communities and create multi-sectoral alliances in your community. Third, enable adaptive capacity for all because we need structural solutions. We cannot rely on individual solutions, um, but we need structural solutions and include also heat action plans at different levels. Fourth, don't focus on acute events only, but also on long-term heat resilience in the context of climate resilience and health system. And five, acknowledge that heat is a risk for health and that sun is not always time and not for it. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer your questions later or as a follow-up. And you can find also all the references in my slides. So please uh, feel free um, to use them. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Smith. Um, we'll move along to Dr. Philippe. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Okay, does it work? Can everybody see the presentation? Yes, looks great. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you, Andrea, for the very nice presentation. It also already introduced some of the things I wanted to say, so we might gain some, some time. Uh, so I represent the Urban Climate team working uh, at VITO, which is a Belgian-based uh, research and technology company active globally. So I will speak about our collaboration with the city of Antwerp, which is nearby in Belgium. Um, and the work I will present is also available as a case study in the Climate Adapt portal of the uh, European Environment Agency. So in my presentation, I want to start by introducing very briefly the urban heat island effect. So that will be very brief because some of it has already been mentioned, but also uh, explaining a little bit our approach in, in modeling and monitoring uh, the urban heat island effect. So I then will uh, continue by explaining the city objectives to tackle this problem and what has actually been done. And I will conclude with some uh, concluding uh, remarks. So the urban heat island effect is in fact the phenomenon that cities are warmer than the rural surroundings. It has multiple negative uh, impacts, as already told. 
uh, and maybe uh, an additional, uh, expli uh, additional explication is that we have a nighttime effect and we have a daytime effect. So the nighttime effect is commonly known as the urban lieutenant effect. Uh, and the daytime effect is that when you look at thermal comfort, uh, which integrates air temperatures, humidity, wind speeds, and radiation loads, cities are also um, uh, the environment in which humans uh, receive an additional heat stress. So about the urban Edelan effect, so this is uh, a scheme that um, includes all physical phenomena that contribute to the urban heat island effect. So the buildings capture the heat uh, during the day and release it during the night. Uh, there's also a lack of vegetation, so you have less ev evapotranspiration in the city. You have anthropogenic heat sources because of the the, the, the large buildings and and and. Um, infrastructure there is less ventilation and uh, the buildings also emit radiation um, i also already spoke about it but besides the urban internet effect i also want to introduce the concept of of thermal comfort um, and this is in fact a parameter that integrates different uh, effects such as wind speed humidity temperature and radiation loads and the commonly used indicator in our work is the wet bulb globe temperature, which is an ISO standard. And in Belgium, this is even integrated in the labor legislation uh, to define the moments of rest that the workers needs to, needs to receive during heat stress, during heat waves. The advantage of using the WBGT parameter is that it is, uh, also includes uh, different heat stress categories, which allows to, uh, which facilitates due communication towards the public uh, in terms of heat stress loads. Um, in, in our work to uh, assess the urban heat island effect of a city, we use the Urklin model, which is a numerical model that in fact downscales large scale climate information in which there is no uh, cities, which, in which cities are not visible uh, using high resolution local urban information such as, uh, for example, the high resolution land cover, vegetation data, the soil ceiling. And the model delivers finally that uh, a database of uh, uh, air temperatures, humidity and wind speeds at 100 meters spatial resolution in which you can distinguish different neighborhoods of the city. The model is quite unique since it allows to calculate long time periods and then to derive climatic uh, indicators. Uh, the model was developed in-house and uh, has been validated for a large number of cities. Uh, you can see here a list of uh, publications. So, and for the first uh, applications, we installed our own measurement stations inside the city of Antwerp to have access to validation data. Uh, since uh, WMO standard guidelines for weather monitoring and climate monitoring uh, are not really promoting stations located inside cities. So there's a lack of urban stations to validate um, urban climate modeling. Uh, at the bottom, you can see the result of a time series uh, during the summer of uh, 2013. And what I want to show you is that this urban heat island effect is a dynamic thing. So it occurs at some nights, but not at all nights. So it depends on the large scale uh, weather, weather conditions, if there is uh, lots of wind, if, if it's cloudy, then the urban heat effect will not appear. On the other hand, when uh, it's clear skies, there's not so much wind, the urban heat and effect can be very prominent. And for example, in Antwerp, we, we had days and nights where the urban heat and effect uh, was as high as 8 to 9 degrees Celsius. Uh, this slide shows you a bit the dynamic behavior of the urban heat island effect during the night. So this is an average. Uh, all the maps that you see are average maps for every hour of the day for a whole summer period. So you can see that um, during the day, uh, in the morning and noon, there is not so much urban heat island effect. It really appears or it becomes prominent when the sun sets and the, uh, and the buildings start to release the heat that they have captured during the day. And the urban heat island effect is in fact at its largest around midnight. So it's really a nighttime phenomenon. Uh, for the city of Antwerp, you can see here uh, a map 
clearly showing the the intensity of the urban heat island effect for the cities uh, of, in, inside the city center compared to the rural outskirts. Um, and yeah, we have here an average um, urban heat island effect of about two degrees Celsius. So, but this is an average daily average value for a whole summer period. So that's why the values are a little bit lower. But this includes days with, like I said, very strong values and more uh, and lower values. So this urban heat island effect in, in view of climate change uh, adds an additional, additional heat stress to the people living in the city. And um, so this, this extra heat stress will be there also in the future. So uh, will increase the effect of, of climate change in terms of, uh, of extreme heat. And as long as the city does not grow significantly, we can suppose that this, this delta, this additional heat stress, will be there in the same order of magnitude, in the same magnitude or the same values will be uh, uh, in the future. Um, we have also in the city been working with citizens, so uh, organizing citizen science measurement campaigns um, using uh, wet belt globe temperature sensors. So really to, uh, to demonstrate the large variability that there is inside the city in terms of thermal comfort. This data uh, was then also used to validate the WBGT model. And you can see on the, on the top left, uh, a city neighborhood. Uh, and you can clearly see that, okay, the, the values are, are, are varying quite, quite largely inside that city district. And this is due to the presence of trees, the presence of water, the shading elements, uh, also the layout of the buildings impact uh, this, uh, this pattern. So um, based on the uh, assessment that we did for the city, uh, the city has defined a number of, of objectives that they uh, to, to reduce, in fact, the uh, heat stress impact. So one of, the, one of the things they want to do is to reduce that heat stress as much as possible through changes in the built environment, because that's one of their responsibilities. They also wanted to inform citizens and engage with them to create uh, support for their actions. And uh, finally, they are also um, looking into uh, operating a heat forecast and warning system targeting the vulnerable groups, because inside cities, you have more heat wave days compared to the rural outskirts and the national heat health warning systems are uh, activated um, based on, on rural values. So you need an, an extra uh, system to inform the people in the city accurately. The, um, the implemented adaptation actions uh, are uh, shown here. So we have uh, the city implemented uh, citywide actions, local skill actions and individual, individual skill actions. So at the city wide scale, the city has adapted its uh, building code uh, and here are a number of things that, that have been done. So all new or renovated roofs with a slope less than 50% uh, need um, a green roof installation compulsory. Also, uh, the installation of private gardens and uh, open parking slots have been uh, obliged, uh, need to be green and permeable. And also um, building fronts need to be painted in light, uh, light colors. Uh, to increase the albedo, so to reflect more sunlight and to reduce the warming of the buildings. Uh, at the local scale, uh, when there is uh, renovations ongoing, the city now has a methodology in which the, uh, the thermal comfort situation needs to be considered. So we have done a couple of studies for the city in which we have been analyzing uh, specific locations, squares, neighborhoods, to quantify the WBGT values and then to assess the impact of, uh, of plant adaptation measures. And uh, more in general, the green-blue infrastructure measures needs to be included in the renovation plans. At the individual scale, the city is investing in the heat stress forecast system, as already mentioned, and uh, is also investing uh, in a web platform to issue the heat wave warnings to health aid workers so that they can distribute the information to the vulnerable groups. So this is already the end of my presentation. So I want to conclude with a few uh, remarks. 
So the main success of the work we have been doing for more than 10 years now uh, is, a, is about raising awareness about this topic at the political level also, so generating the will to tackle the problem and to uh, free money to invest. Uh, the projects that we have been doing have also really helped to um, improve the communication between the different stakeholders because this problem was not known uh, and it's also not that visible. So by modeling and monitoring uh, the heat, uh, urban heat energy effect and heat stress, we collect tangible information that then can be used in communication uh, activities. So lots of the work that we have been doing was financed by European projects, but also the city itself financed uh, uh, a starting study. So it's still it's still running. So we're still working in collaboration with the city, and uh, yeah, the implementation of the measures itself is a is, is a very slow process. So uh, if you want to have a nice tree to cool the uh, a street, you need to plant it now in order for it to be large and effective in the future. So, uh, and finally, um, yeah, the city expects that the, um, the most of the work needs to be completed by, by 2030. So, um, yeah, this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Philip Lefebvre. And we'll move to... Um... Dr. Marco Moravito's presentation without further delay. Can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. So good morning from Italy, and uh, uh, I am very uh, happy to be invited at this event and to present a case study that we carried out thanks to the collaboration between the National Research Council and the uh, Italian Workers' Compensation Authority, the INAID. Uh, this uh, case study uh, was carried out in the field of uh, two projects. One is the work climate project that finished in 2022, and the other one is the work climate 2.0 uh, that is uh, underway and will finish in uh, May of 2025. Uh, both projects uh, had and actually and currently have uh, the aim to study the impact of uh, extreme temperatures on occupational sectors, uh, developing uh, strategies and operational procedures such as uh, heat warning system addressed to the occupational uh, sector. Uh, the uh, temperature anomaly uh, trend in Italy, unfortunately, uh, follow what is happening uh, worldwide and, uh, and, and show a clear uh, progressive and significant increase of uh, temperature, uh, especially in the last 20 uh, years. And this trend uh, was also uh, confirmed during the summer of 2023 when uh, the, the Italy anomaly ranks uh, uh, the sixth, eighth, and seventh warmest uh, summer in northern, central, and southern uh, Italy, uh, respectively. Uh, the reason uh, why workers are uh, considered particularly uh, vulnerable uh, to, uh, to the exposure to the thermal uh, extremes are various and are uh, dependent uh, in particular uh, on the fact that workers cannot uh, avoid their uh, activities during uh, working hour of during the working hours for economic and productive 
reasons. Uh, therefore, uh, workers can be considered at higher risk because directly exposed to solar radiation or, or other sources of radiant heat, or can wear personal uh, protective, uh, protective equipment uh, that uh, limit uh, the transpiration, can be engaged in intense physical activity, or can have physical characteristics that can aggravate the situation of its exposure. In addition, there is the increase of workforce aging. Uh, um, of course, at the European uh, level, uh, just think in the weakening of the thermal regulation system with aging or a lesser ability to maintain homeostasis in response to environmental challenges. And there is a lot of evidence uh, uh, which uh, uh, showed increasing risk of occupational injuries uh, associated with high temperatures uh, worldwide, with several examples also at the uh, Italian uh, level. In particular, in the field of the World Climate Project, we uh, published last year uh, two epidemiological studies uh, investigating the, the relationships between injuries and uh, extreme temperatures and injuries in specific occupational sectors, um, particularly vulnerable to, uh, to the environment, such as the construction sector in the, in the upper graph and the agricultural sector in the uh, bottom graph. Concerning this last uh, study, uh, this was uh, carried out on, during over a five-year period from the, the year 2014 to 2018 on uh, about 150,000 uh, injuries in the agricultural sector. And as you can see, uh, we uh, found an overall significant relative risk uh, uh, of 1.13. Uh, and uh, we also found a higher risk for young workers. This is probably because uh, inexperience or because they tend to underestimate uh, the risk. And higher risk were also observed for occasional self-employed workers or workers engaged in outdoor and labor intensive activities and workers uh, carried out uh, um, land preparation. Uh, um, in this table, you can see uh, the number of injuries uh, over uh, in each uh, uh, Italian regions. And as you can see, the Apulia region uh, was the uh, uh, southern region with the highest number of injuries and the mean temperature and the number of heat waves, and especially uh, revealed the highest mean temperature during heat waves with the, an average value above 28 degrees Celsius. This uh, situation was also confirmed, uh, this was situation in the Apulia region was also confirmed by another study that was published last year, where we found the highest number of occupational heat related illness and injuries as reported by the Italia Online newspaper. Uh, one of the main activities that we carried out in the field of our climate project was the development uh, of a, a customized heat warning system by using one of the main indicators uh, used internationally to uh, evaluate the impact of its stress in the occupational sector, the wet bulb globe temperature, the WBGT, that is clearly described uh, in the ISO standard 7243 updated in 2017. And one of the main features of this warning system uh, is to provide a customized forecast. Uh, this is uh, the main challenge uh, that uh, we had in the World Climate Project based on various exposure scenarios and to which a worker uh, may be exposed. Uh, this is the web page of the um, forecast platform uh, where, uh, available on the World Climate website, where the information released to a healthy workers, not acclimatized to it and exposed to different occupational scenarios. So a user can choose uh, from different scenarios, uh, for example, uh, to have a forecast for a workers in sun or in the shade or employing different physical activities. 
and then um, you can see the uh, three-day forecast for four periods of the day, the early morning, midday, in the afternoon, and uh, late in the evening, uh, with uh, a risk legend uh, on different uh, level of risks from known to high uh, risk level. And for each risk level, suggestions are uh, available to counteract that specific uh, situation. This is just to show you the difference from the uh, two different um, scenarios. On the left, you have uh, the forecast uh, for a worker um, uh, employed in, a, in an intense physical activity in the sun. On the right is uh, uh, in the shadow. And as you can see, during the day, uh, there is significant differences from the two uh, scenarios, even uh, in the afternoon. And this is very important because we should take into consideration this kind of information to provide the best solution to counteract the, the heat effect. Uh, during um, in the summer of uh, 2021, um, a, a dramatic event uh, occurred, a fatal event occurred, involving uh, a 27 years old agricultural worker who died in Puglia after working many hours under the sun at high temperatures. And uh, immediately after this dramatic event, the public health authorities uh, in Apulia and it precipitately um, an ordinance by using the information available on the uh, work climate platform. And in this way, forbidding uh, the working activity in the agricultural sector from 12.30 to uh, 16, when for a specific location, a high risk level uh, was uh, forecasted. And this information also, was also reported on a recent publication uh, on, on an international journal where uh, we uh, found that these um, public health measures impacted almost 7 million of inhabitants and almost 200,000 agricultural for, for workers. And this ordinance was also published in the same year in other Italian southern regions and was reissued in the summer of 2022 uh, and the last summer in 2023. In this last uh, slide, I just wanna show you uh, the situation uh, of the warning provided on the basis of the ordinance in all the province of uh, the Apulia region, which clearly show um, that in some provinces of the Puglia, over 40% of the summer days required the work ban from 12.30 to uh, 16. And as you can see in this table, the relative risk was even higher in other regions, higher than those observed in the Apulia region. So in this region, uh, actions will be needed in the next uh, years. And we are currently underwaying a um, cost-benefit study to demonstrate the effectiveness uh, of this policy uh, intervention. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I am available to answer any question. Thank you very much to um, all of you, Andrea, Philip, and uh, Marco. I'll just start with some of the questions. I don't think we'll have enough time to answer them all, but if we could have uh, at least a couple. So um, I was going to ask uh, Andrea whether she knows if there are any different definitions of heat waves based on the underlying health conditions of the populations. Yes, I saw the question. I think it's quite an interesting one. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, um, <clears throat> many countries are using a standard definition for heat waves that is then also used for alert um, that is not taking into account vulnerability factors such as age or um, chronic conditions. And um, I do not know if there's like a specific definition of heat wave, but the implication in principle is the same. So basically um, the question is whether we could, uh, whether or how our public health systems would be able to 
um, communicate uh, heat-related risks already earlier to certain groups. So, for example, um, and there are already some initiatives that were showed before the the app at the, at the European level. Um, but also some care homes might have specific warning systems um, that uh, already before a heat wave occurs for the general population, they and an elevated heat risk is communicated to certain settings, such as care homes or community centers, etc. So I think we need to think about solutions for that because um, what we know from the media, um, reporting, um, it's not so straightforward to report about heat either because many people are still associating hot weather and sunshine, especially in Europe, with positive um, feelings. And so um, we've heard, for example, from national media uh, agencies that there are actually even uh, you know harassment and calls when, when there are warnings about heat. So it's not straightforward how to communicate this to the general population. But then again, some groups have a much elevated risk um, already much earlier. So I think it's a bit of an open discussion, but um, yeah, there's no uh, definition that separately of heat waves are related to the health state. But it's a very interesting question. Thank you. Now, one question for um, Philip which I find really interesting is, are there differences in the quality of the trees? Uh, so are there some trees that are preferable to in terms of reducing the um, urban heat island effect to other <clears throat> trees and also considering the benefits on reduction on, uh, of air pollution? So if you, were a, if you were an urban planner and had a, an infinite pot of money, which trees would you recommend? And does that vary across Europe as well? Thank you, Kat, for the uh, very interesting question, which I think you could talk an hour about it or even more, because uh, I think about the type of tree, you want a tree that keeps functioning during heat waves, during drought moments. So I think you need at least, yeah, a really a drought resistant tree that continues to evaporate and acts as a natural air conditioning uh, um, in, in the city. Um, I think it's also important uh, if you look at, for example, the, the possible uh, interaction with air pollution. If you put a tree at the wrong location, it might lead to even, at, for example, if you put a tree in a street canyon and it blocks completely the ventilation of the street with the upper air, it might block air pollution under the tree and increase air pollution levels. Uh, so you need to be careful also where you put a tree. Uh, and then in terms of uh, one of the most effective uh, impacts of trees is the shading. So uh, trees with uh, large uh, crowns that create a lot of shade are very effective in, effective in reducing heat. But um, yeah, I think so the type of tree really depends on the, on the climate you're in. So you need a tree that is drought resistant uh, and can keep functioning even during long periods of droughts. Otherwise, the tree will will really will not function, will not evaporate. So uh, and that's an important effect. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I think it would be also interesting to know in terms of air pollution, whether there are some trees that are preferable to others, but I don't know if you know about that. I'm not a real expert on that domain, so I should ask yeah. my colleagues. Yeah, I expected that, but just curiosity. So now, uh, finally, one question for Mark. Um, When uh, assessing the wider impact of the polio interventions, are one health sectoral partners being engaged in the process to evaluate the impact, for instance, in terms of animal health? It's a very interesting topic. Uh, actually, in the, in the field of the work climate project, uh, we uh, just uh, calibrated uh, the, the customized forecast just for uh, humans, uh, for uh, men, uh, for workers. 
uh, but um, personally, uh, I have seen that there is a great attention also for the uh, work of animals. Uh, for example, uh, there are, um, especially in Sicily, uh, there, there are uh, warnings also addressed to horses, for example, and uh, that take care uh, about uh, uh, the animal uh, needing. Uh, of course, in the future, it could be uh, implemented or uh, could be... Uh, there are other experiences, for example, uh, concerning the quality of a product derived by animals, for example, the milk or uh, other uh, products. Uh, but actually, our our experience is related to uh, to find solutions to uh, uh, against uh, to to improve the health and the productivity in the in the work environment. Uh, animals are not still considered, but it could be an idea for future uh, project, of course. Thank you very much. We are uh, two minutes to the end of the session. I think I'm just going to ask Marco one question because this is a very short one. Do you think that um, exposure to agricultural chemicals will also increase as a result of climate change and may compound the effect of heat? Yes, of course. Uh, the uh chemical components uh, interact strongly uh, with uh, uh, with heat, uh, especially um, when, for example, uh, we are sweating. And this is the reason why uh, in the agricultural sector, uh, the uh, workers generally uh, dress completely, just avoiding uh, the skin uh, free, uh, just because uh, there are chemical components. So, of course, this aspect should be should be uh, always taken uh, strongly into consideration uh, because inter uh, it clearly interacts uh, with the management of heat stress, for example. Great. Thank you very much. We are right on time to end. Thank you very much to Marco, Philip, and Andrea for the awesome presentations. The feedback from the participants is great. I think everyone is thanking you for your time and your effort in uh, preparing all the, the sessions. I think um, there are plenty of questions that were not answered. So we'll kindly ask you to answer the questions offline and we'll uh, post the, the questions together with the slides and all the resources online, because this is a very important topic. And uh, the, 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 it, it's the fact that the presentations are so interesting that there are so many that uh, led to so many questions. I would also like to thank to all the participants and finally, thank the ASPER and GCCHE for uh, uh, allowing this course to happen and that so many people to benefit from it. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you next week for our next lecture. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.